Hello, my gentle and of course very modern apes. We're still playing catch up on all the cool news that came out while I was studying for my comps. And so today I wanna to talk to you about another unique human thing or semi-unique human thing that has been recently found, surprise, in chimpanzees. Add it to the list. I probably don't need to tell you this, but humans are kind of weird. Amongst the extant or still living hominids, the great apes, we're like these egg-headed dorks who walk around on two legs and communicate using these overly complicated vocalization systems. We take forever to develop, like our kids are born next level helpless and then they take a long time to reach adulthood. We even have a name for it, an extended developmental period referred to as adolescence. And it's in another one of these really weird life history stages that humans differ from like almost everything else, period. And that's something you might not have considered because a lot of people don't talk about it at all. Like seriously, you would think this would be covered in sex ed. Of course I'm talking about menopause. Menopause is a life history stage that begins 12 months after a female's last period. And it is characterized by the loss of the ability to reproduce. That last little bit is an important point because those of you out there who might be on birth control and aren't undergoing menstrual cycles anymore, you're not in menopause. And the reason for this is because the second that those suppressing hormones are removed, your hormones naturally will kick in and initiate the buildup of that lining once again. You can still reproduce. Those who have truly undergone menopause as a life stage, however, can't reproduce anymore. And this is because the hormones that cause menopause to occur, or rather the lack of hormones that cause menopause to occur, don't just impact the uterine lining, but also the ovaries and the egg quantities and qualities themselves. Evolutionarily, the loss of the ability to reproduce is already incredibly rare and incredibly strange, but it gets even more bizarre when you consider that menopause typically impacts human females between the ages of 40 and 50. Considering the lowest average life expectancies today hover around the age of 60, that would suggest one-sixth of a human female's life is post-reproductive. And that's like a conservative estimate. If we look in the majority of locations where humans live 70, 80 years of age, and menopause is maybe starting around 40, at least perimenopause and a dip in reproduction, then you're looking at half of the lifespan being post-reproductive. And that is really bizarre, particularly since human males do not experience anything analogous to this. In an extremely simplified sense, evolution is focused on fitness, your ability to reproduce, and how many offspring you leave behind. So the fact that menopause happens is very puzzling, especially considering how early it happens. How and why would something like this evolve in the first place? I feel like it's important to note that a lot of the early peerings into the origins of menopause were seeded with some pretty intense misogyny, and in that spirit, menopause was kind of treated as this, like, hyper senescence. Senescence being the deterioration of the physical condition of an organism through its life history. In the really olden days, the 1800s, menopause was seen as a disease that just, I guess, happened to impact every female on the planet. <laughs> The complexion is pale or sallow, or there may be a drowsy look, or the dull, stupid astonishment of one seeking to rouse herself to answer a question. And progress was slow. About 80 years later, in the 1960s, Robert Wilson published his book Feminine Forever, in which he referred to menopause as living decay. I don't think that any of this is particularly surprising. For most of the 19th and 20th century, men kind of dominated the space of of science and they don't undergo menopause, so of course it must be something aberrant. But even when everyone collectively came to their senses and realized that menopause is a natural biological process that impacts every female on the planet eventually, there was still the puzzle of why. Evolutionarily speaking, why would human females evolve the loss of reproductive ability for about half their lifespans? And why would males 
not. So before we get too into the weeds on this, sort of socio-ecologically speaking, I have to tell you first a little bit about some very basic concepts that you should probably understand before moving forward. The first is sexual selection and how it works, and the second is the root cause of sexual selection, anisogamy. Anisogamy is a type of sexual reproduction that involves two gametes of differing sizes. In the vast majority of sexually reproducing animals, we're looking at eggs and sperm. And these two are very different. Eggs are big and expensive, and sperm are small and cheap. Anisogamy is thought to be the reason as to why, at least in most social animals, females are the pickier sex and males are not as choosy, because females have a lot more to lose if they waste one of their precious eggs on a less than ideal mate. Males, on the other hand, can be flagrant. They increase their fitness no matter who they're inseminating, and they can just make more sperm. This sounds like a bad lot for the females at first, until you remember that the female knows that her offspring is hers. She's the one that lays those eggs or gives birth to that offspring. She can guarantee her paternity. Males, on the other hand, might inseminate a dozen other female individuals and may end up not being the father of any of them. All of this to say, whether you're a male or a female in sexually reproducing animals, there's going to be pros and cons, and those pros and cons boil down to the inherent nature of anisogamy. In social animals, particularly social mammals and particularly primates, this entire scheme gets even more complicated. The cost doesn't end at just the egg being larger and more expensive to make, because after insemination, then you have either gestation or incubation. There is an additional enormous metabolic cost for the mother to actually develop that young, be it in an egg or in a womb, and then birth or hatching occurs, followed by provisioning or lactation, or both. To put this in perspective, in humans, a individual is going to be operating at approximately 2.2 times their basal metabolic rate while pregnant. And lactation or breastfeeding in humans can burn 500 to 700 calories per day. That's insane. This is reflected in other primates as well. In Sykes monkeys or Cercopithecus albulgaris, where females are around 40% the size of males, they eat 30% more than their male colleagues when they are pregnant. Reproduction is going to get more and more difficult for both sexes as age goes up. For males, older individuals are going to get boxed out by picky females and stronger males, while older females may not be able to compete as fiercely as their younger conspecifics can for resources. In the case of the males, they're simply going to settle into a non-reproductive role within their social group, or they're going to get chased off and die alone. But remember, males aren't picky, so older females might continue well into old age to reproduce with riskier and riskier pregnancies and lactational periods until they are metabolically spent, after which they will die. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, menopause all of a sudden makes a whole lot of sense, and it should make sense for both sexes in most animals, right? Because if you just take away the ability to reproduce at some point, then there's no risk. The males might just settle into that non-reproductive role before competition kills them or they get scared off, and females just don't have to risk pregnancy. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. So remember, evolution works on a species level or a population level, not on an individual level. So it doesn't really care too much about characteristics that benefit an individual post its reproductive period. Let's use an example with mayflies. Mayflies are arthropods that live one day. They have one day or 24 hours to be born, reproduce, and die. There are all sorts of characteristics that you can think of within mayflies that might benefit their fitness. Maybe faster mayflies can inseminate more females in their brief lifespan. Maybe bigger mayflies can lay more eggs at any given moment. Maybe mayflies that have different colors are more attractive to other mayflies and entice them to mate more frequently. Now let's say we have one mayfly that hatches one year, and she has an incredible gene within her that allows her to live to be 100 years old, which is incidentally longer than many of you out there will live to be. But let's say that she can only reproduce for that first day. Her reproduction completely plummets, it tanks after that very first day of life. So she lives a super long time, but she can only reproduce for 24 hours. 
well, that long age gene doesn't actually benefit her reproductively in any way then, does it? It doesn't aid her fitness at all. That first day, she's completely indistinguishable from every other mayfly on the block. Selectively, this magnificent long age gene that is just fantastic to the individual mayfly, theoretically, it's just invisible. Genetic drift people? Shut up. I'm trying to oversimplify something here. Let me cook. So again, how the heck do you get menopause in a situation like this? How is it selected for? I mean, again, it's possible, drift people, that this just showed up by chance, but I don't really find that convincing. And this is my show. I'm feeling very adaptionist today. Luckily, there's a very simple concept that might trust this up quite nicely, and it's called kin selection. Kin selection is pretty involved and there's a lot we can get into here, so again, the theme of today is simplified, so we can probably just sum it up with a couple of quick questions, right? If you were charged with saving a person from a tar pit and your options were your brother, your cousin, or a stranger, it's probably pretty easy, assuming that you have typical familial relations, to guess who you're gonna pick. In fact, if your family relationship isn't horrible, you could probably like, stage these in order. You would most likely save your brother first, then your cousin, then the stranger. And this is pretty normal. We're more likely to save people or to help people we know as opposed to those that we don't know, and who do we know better than the ones we grew up with? Again, highly simplified. This idea squares nicely with a general observation in primatology that in social species of primates, individuals are more likely to help kin members as opposed to non-kin members. We call it nepotism. This makes sense intuitively and it also makes sense genetically. Siblings and then cousins each share a lot of the genome that you possess. You and your sibling are ridiculously similar genetically, you're also pretty dang similar to your cousin, and so on and so forth, moving from kin to non-kin. And so, if you help your sibling, you are kind of helping yourself, aren't you? Because you guys share a lot of the same genes. You might not reproduce, but your sister might. And this is where the term, the selfish gene, comes from. You might actually increase your fitness by aiding your kin, and so it's like a nice safety net if you fail to reproduce. So back to menopause. As I said, people finally came around to the idea that this is just a natural process and one that kind of needed an explanation. And so the first question was, are humans the only species that go through menopause? And even back then, the answer was no but the exceptions came from a very surprising place. Outside of humans, every single other mammal that underwent menopause was a marine mammal and specifically a cetacean, like killer whales. So scientists put two and two together here and were like, all right, if individuals can kind of boost their own fitness by aiding their kin, maybe we should see how older females impact the fitness of those around them in non-human species that undergo menopause, like for instance, killer whales. Long-term observation of killer whales revealed some pretty striking patterns with regard to the influence that grandmothers have on other individuals within their pod. Calves in pods that did not have a grandmother present had a 4.5 times higher mortality rate than calves who did have a grandmother present in the pod. And menopausal killer whales don't stop helping their immediate offspring either. Males who had mothers who were postmenopausal in their pod had fewer wounds, fewer bite marks and scars than males who didn't have a postmenopausal mother or whose mother had died. These observations have been repeated in other cetaceans as well, and have led to this idea called the grandmother effect. Effectively, females halt their own reproduction so that they can aid in increasing the fitness of their offspring and their offspring's offspring. And because they're increasing the fitness of kin that bear their same genes, or at least a lot of their same genes, this actually becomes a selectable trait. 
But this is only possible for the females in these species because they know who their offspring are and they know who their offspring's offspring are. Males do not have the same luxury because a lot of these cetaceans are polygynous. So why would a male invest in offspring that he's not sure is even his? What's interesting is that these cetaceans go through menopause around the same time in their lifespan as human females do. About 50 years of age is when that hard cutoff for the ceasing of reproduction is. And so that begs the question, why don't other apes undergo menopause? On the face of it, there aren't really that many differences, right? They live about as long as humans do without the advent of modern medicine or as cetaceans do, and they have very similar social systems. So like, why don't they also undergo menopause? And the answer is sometimes they do. So this actually puzzled me for a pretty long time, right? Like humans ancestrally have similar mating systems and similar lifespans to both chimpanzees and odontocetes, the toothed whales that we've looked at thus far. But only the odontocetes have exhibited menopause to the exclusion of the chimps. And I was like, that's so strange. Like that shouldn't be, it struck me as very weird. And it turns out that actually some chimps were observed as going through menopause, but strictly in captivity where resources are plentiful. Now, the lifespan of chimpanzees in the wild, much like the lifespan of humans without access to all of our modern amenities, is significantly lower. Most chimpanzees in the wild, for instance, are not going to hit 50. This is compared to cetaceans, specifically our, our toothed whales here, the killer whales, which actually just do live to be quite old, even in the wild. It might just be due to their sheer size and lack of any real predators, but not the case with chimps. So you have old-aged odontocetes undergoing menopause, old-aged humans undergoing menopause, and well-provisioned, long-lived, captive chimpanzees undergoing menopause. So what researchers did is they switched to a very well-off group of chimpanzees, specifically the Ngogo community. This was a large-scale study done on the Ngogo chimps of Uganda and specifically focused, obviously, on their endocrinology. So a lot of urine and fecal samples from, like, old-aged chimpanzee females within the group. And what they found is that the females that were over the age of 50, an age they were able to reach because this specific spot in Uganda has just a lot of resources for the chimpanzees to exploit, uh, these old-age females were menopausal. They were postmenopausal. So okay then, it might just be that for a lot of mammal species, if the females live long enough for long enough in a population, menopause is just going to be kind of a natural consequence of that, a happy accident. But hold the phone, because female chimpanzees do not actually help their offspring or their offspring's offspring. And this is because females disperse from their natal groups. Once they become of age, it is the females that leave and join a new group, not the males. So unlike in orcas, the killer whales, females can actually only help their male offspring, not their female offspring. The authors instead point to an alternative hypothesis that can actually work in tandem with the grandmother hypothesis, the reproductive conflict hypothesis. This hypothesis points out that older females in species that have females as the dispersing sex are going to be more likely to be related to any given male in a group than younger females are, because the younger females have more recently immigrated into the group. This combined with the greater ability of younger females as compared to older females to compete for resources suggests that it might just be for the greater good, as it were, that older females cease reproduction. In this case, I think it's mostly an anti-incest thing, an incest avoidance tactic for older females who are growing increasingly more related to the group in which they live as they age. Anti-incest tactics in social animals are pretty commonly selected for because offspring produced by incest are more likely to have issues that prevent them from maturing completely and going on to produce offspring of their own. The authors point out that the reproductive conflict hypothesis and the grandmother hypothesis are not mutually exclusive and indeed I think it's probably fair to say that the reproductive conflict hypothesis could potentially precede the grandmother hypothesis. After all, if you're sitting around not reproducing, you might as well help your sons out, maybe aiding them in their rank within the hierarchy. 
I wonder if there's a species where we see that kind of behavior. Well, we see it in bonobos, don't we? Panpaniscus, our other closest living relative. These animals are very similar to chimpanzees, but they're matriarchal and form close-knit female relationships as opposed to close-knit male relationships. The females are still the sex that disperses, but females within their own groups will help their sons out in their position within the hierarchy. So I think the inevitable next question is, do bonobos undergo menopause if they live long enough? And as far as I can tell, I don't think there's an answer to this question yet. But if they do undergo menopause, and it's that same time period of around 50 years of age, I think you have a pretty decent flowchart of events that you could set up. You have any socially living group of mammal that over time increases their lifespan enough so that females might live to or over the age of 50. At that point, the reproductive conflict hypothesis kicks in, especially if they're female dispersing, and as a result, you give an opening for females to invest in the reproductive success of their sons. It could be daughters too, but I'm starting here from like a panin-like common ancestor because we're trying to explain human menopause here, or at least the retention of it. Females invest in the success of their sons who carry their genes, and as a result, if they help their sons attain a higher role in the hierarchy, their sons reproduce more often, pass those genes on, and over time you're going to see the continued selection for maternal and grand maternal involvement in the success of their offspring and grand offspring, respectively. But this can only happen if there is that initial physiological block for older females as far as giving birth to new offspring goes. Still, I think it's pretty interesting that chimpanzees undergo menopause, and this would potentially suggest that menopause is much more ancient within our lineage than we initially thought. Perhaps grandmothering is as old as Australopithecus, Ardipithecus, Auroran, Sahelanthropus, and earlier still. Call your grandmother. If you like what I do, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. This is a free way in which you can help me and support the channel generally. And if you want to help me even more uh, in a financial way, acting as a sort of financial and metaphorical grandmother, if you will, you can join my Patreon. The link is in the description. I know some of you out there are wondering, well, where do proboscideans fit into all this? I don't know. I was looking into it very briefly and they're weird because they're also very long-lived mammals. And it seems like females don't reproduce after a certain age, or at least a lot of them don't, but they don't technically go into menopause, at least with regard to their endocrinology. Like their hormones don't suggest that they're actually in menopause. So maybe they're in like a, a precursor period. I'm not really sure. You guys should talk about it in the comments. That would be a great excuse for you to go down there and type something up. And in the meantime, my gentle and of course very modern apes, I will see you in the next one. Thank you.